This is the portion of this lab that is most difficult for students and oftentimes most intimidating for teachers. So I'm going to step you through the process and give you some tips and tricks along the way. Also, this is a great cross-curricular activity. If you have a good working relationship with your math teacher, as I am fortunate enough to have, we actually do this lab together, which the way that looks in our setting is the students collect their data in science class. Depending on time and where the math teacher is in her curriculum and I am in my science curriculum, we'll determine which class they actually do the graphing in. So sometimes they will complete their graph of that initial data in science class. Sometimes they will complete that graph in math class. And sometimes that is their homework assignment, just depending on how we are in time within the school year. And then they actually do the slope intercept formula math part in math class with the math teacher. They then bring their results from that equation back to science class and we have a test your hypothesis day where we actually take the number of rubber bands and test and see how far Barbie does fall, how close she gets to the floor. And I have some pictures and ideas that I will add to the end as far as where you can actually do that test from within your school. So here I have sample data from one of my students from this year. We are going to graph this data to start with. Now what we need to know first, of course, anytime we graph something in science, is which is the dependent variable and which is the independent variable. So one of the ways that I teach my students and one of the ways I use to remember this myself is I use dry mix. So the D in dry is dependent. I actually have an anchor chart with this that I put in my classroom, also known as the responding variable. I like to tell my students that the R is the results of the experiment. This is what you are actually recording within your data table. And then the Y, of course, is the Y axis. So in this particular experiment, the dependent variable is the distance Barbie falls. And then the independent variable is the mix part of dry mix. The M stands for manipulated variable, which is the thing the experimenter changes on purpose. This is what we are testing, what we are purposely changing in the experiment, that variable that we are manipulating on purpose. I is independent variable, which is the terminology, termi I'm sorry, the terminology we tend to use in science. And then the X, of course, is the X axis. So I tell my students that the independent variable is the thing that you write in your data table ahead of time. For instance, when using this sample data, when they create the data table, they have already written the number of rubber bands in the data table. This is what they are manipulating on purpose, their independent variable. And then this is the results of their experiment or the responding variable. It is responding to that independent variable. It depends on what this number is. So now we are going to use this data to graph I 
buy these clear rulers at the Dollar Tree. I don't know about your students, but mine are super, super strong and just accidentally break my rulers on a very regular basis. They just don't know their own strength. So you can get these three for a dollar at Dollar Tree. Um, they are a little flimsier than the ones you would get, say, from um, ETA or something like that that are a little thicker, but again, my students are so strong, no matter how thick they are, they tend to accidentally break. So I just buy the cheap ones. Um, it's nice to have the clear rulers and you will see why that works well in just a little while. I also instruct my students when they are graphing that it is the goal to use as much of the graph paper as possible. You want to make your graph fill as much of this area as you possibly can. So, the first thing you have to do is determine your range. So my range for my x-axis, the independent variable, the number of rubber bands, is simply six. Please teach your students to always start at the origin. Also, you have to leave a little space at the bottom to label your axes and to put in your numbers. So I'm gonna draw a nice straight line. For this lab in particular, it is best if you do not skip spaces on the X axis. For some reason, it just makes it a lot easier to find that line of best fit and it's more accurate. So we have the origin at zero, one rubber band, which of course we are not gonna graph because we have no data for one rubber band. Two, three, four, five, and six. Now our data goes up to 93. So we need a range of zero to 93 on our Y axis. I teach my students to use intervals of one, two, fives, tens, then maybe fifties, one hundreds, something that's very easy to determine. So for this particular lab, I think fives is the best we can do since we have to go from zero all the way up to 93. So we are gonna label each line at an interval of five. It's okay to skip those lines as long as they hold the same value. So even though I'm not writing in 75, it still holds that value of 75. It saves a little time and keeps things a little neater uh, so you don't have so much jumbled up close together. Now, of course, we have to label our axes. This is the number of rubber bands, which does not really require a unit of measurement because the unit of measurement is the number of rubber bands. And then on our y-axis, this is the distance Barbie Falls. This one does require a unit of measurement. I always have my students write their unit of measurement in parentheses. And then they need a title for their graph. So this particular graph is the initial data for Barbie's bungee ride. I do not give my students the title for the graph. That is something they have to determine. I always tell them that the title should tell me what it is I'm looking at in that data. And so I make them create that title themselves. Also, as a side note, <laughs> This is the lab in the year in which I introduced them to uh, spreadsheets. And so as you can tell, this uh, data came from, directly from a spreadsheet that 
the students will record their data on the spreadsheet. Part of the reason I started using sheets in this particular lab is because it was easy for them to have their data available when they went to math class since it was in their Google Drive rather than a piece of paper that they could lose or misplace in between. Uh, but it proved to be a great technology integration. So I, we go from putting our data into the data table online, then they have to graph it by hand. After they graph it by hand and turn that graph in, I show them how to create the graph within Google Sheets. It will also add a line of best fit, which in spreadsheets is referred to as a trend line. There's some manipulation and things students have to figure out to get the graph to look correct. But um, as I said, it's a great technology integration. And then from this point forward in my class, they have the option of graphing by hand or using a graph on Google Sheets. And the reason I give them that option is they have already graphed quite a bit in seventh grade science. And then we graph for the whole first semester. And this lab, as you notice, comes about halfway through that second semester curriculum. So we've already done a lot of graphing by hand. They've had a lot of practice. So I feel like using the spreadsheet is taking that a step further. So we're going to graph our data here. For two rubber bands, we have 43 centimeters. Sometimes the students freak out because there is not a 43 on the paper. And so, you know, that is where those problem solving skills come in where I don't give them the answer to that problem. I tell them, where do you think 43 is on this graph? And they can easily figure that out. Four rubber bands is at 67. Five rubber bands is at 79. and six rubber bands at 93. So just by looking at these data points, you can see where this line is going. You can already tell that if we continued, this line is going to basically go in this direction. And that is what your line of best fit is or your trend line. It is the trend of the data. So what I tell my students is you want to put as many points directly on the line as possible and have the same number of points above the line as you do below the line if your points are scattered out. This is a great data set because as you can see, it's almost a perfect straight line. I also tell them make sure you take your line through the Y axis. So there we have our trend line. Now, if you have a group of students who are struggling with the trend line, a little trick you can give them is the y-axis should be the height of Barbie. Now that is one of the questions in the conclusion part of this lab is what is the significance of the Y axis. But if you think about the process, if Barbie was hanging from just her feet with no rubber bands, then what does that distance represent? Well, it represents her height. So um, if you have students who are really struggling with finding that trend line, some people just don't have that spatial recognition to recognize that. If you give them the point on the y-axis at which the line will cross, which is the y-intercept, that will help to make sure that trend line is going in the right direction. So speaking of y-intercept, the reason we need this line from this data is we are going to use the slope-intercept formula to calculate how many rubber bands we are going to need from any given distance. So in this particular set of data,
we are going to use the slope intercept formula, which is y equals mx plus b. With m being the slope, b being the y-intercept, y being the point on the y-axis, which of course is equal to the distance Barbie falls, and x being the point on the x-axis, which is equal to the number of rubber bands needed. So the premise of the lab is you are creating a bungee ride for Barbie. And she is going to fall from an undisclosed distance. And then students have to determine how many rubber bands they need for Barbie to have the most exciting ride and come within millimeters of reaching the bottom of that fall without actually touching the ground. So some options for that. I have a tall blue cabinet in my classroom that we use every year. That cabinet happens to be 204 centimeters from the tippy top to the floor. So my distance Barbie falls, which is my Y value, is going to be 204 centimeters. Now that you give to the students when they begin their calculations. Some other options, if you have a staircase in the school, that is always very exciting. You will need a lot of rubber bands, but very, very cool. Um, also, if your school has a volleyball team, then they probably have that little ladder set up that sits at the end of the volleyball poles that the referees stand on during a volleyball game. So that is an option. Bleachers in the gym. Um, if you want to keep it kind of small and limited number of rubber bands then off of a countertop or off of a desk are options. However, those will most likely fall within the data set they have already calculated. Um, so there are lots of options just depending on your setup. I think it would be super cool to do one from the top of the bleachers at the football field or maybe from the press box. Um, also, a lot of times the band will have a, a tall band stand in their practice area. That would be super cool to do. I have not tried those yet. Whatever that is, you have to take those measurements ahead of time. So, as I said, my cabinet is 204 centimeters from the top to the floor, which is our Y value. We are solving for X, so we need to know what is the slope and what is the y-intercept? So y-intercept is easy. If you have ensured that your students have drawn their line through the y-axis, it looks like our y-intercept is 21. And then slope is a little trickier. So you need to find a point where your line crosses directly through the crosshairs on your graph. And this line is not being very kind in that aspect. There is one. And I believe this one's pretty close right here. So slope, of course, is rise over run. And again, if you plan well with your math teacher, your students should know that. That's a good little quiz and you get those looks like why are we doing math and science class. Also, you have to keep in mind how many, how much value each of these squares have. So again, on the y-axis, each of our squares has a five point value. So this is 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. And then over here, each of these simply has a one point value. So our slope is rise, 35, over run, which is three. 
Now we can set up our equation. Now that we have determined our y-intercept and our slope based on our graph, we can use the y-intercept formula to determine what our x value or how many rubber bands we need for Barbie to fall from the given distance. Again, in my classroom, that distance is 204 centimeters. So we have y equals mx plus b, which is the y-intercept formula. In this formula, m is the slope, b is the y-intercept, y represents the y-axis, which is the distance Barbie falls, And x is the x-axis, which is the number of rubber bands. Now the purpose of our lab is to determine how many rubber bands we need for Barbie to fall the given distance. Our given distance is 204 centimeters. Our slope is 35 thirds, or 35 over 3. The x value is the variable we are looking for, and our y-intercept is 21 centimeters. So this is our formula. Now in my class, I walk through the algebra of isolating x by itself with my students, and I do that before we plug our numbers in. So if we have y, sorry, that's messy y equals mx plus b, and we need x by itself. It just seems a little easier for my students to manipulate this formula algebraically when it is just letters. I know that's crazy because the letters is what they complain about in math, but it just makes it a little easier for them to visualize, I think. There may be a new Common Core way to do this, but I don't know what it is if there is. I do it old school. So we're going to subtract b from both sides of the equation. So we have y minus b equals m times x. And then we still have to get the x by itself, so we are going to divide both sides by m. And we end up with y minus b divided by m equals x because these cancel each other out or reduce to one. So then with this equation and this process on the board, as well as this description to remind them which letters represent which values in the lab, I leave the students to use their own data to do the calculations. There is one other reminder that they need through the process, and I usually give that to them at this point and remind them of PEMDAS or the order of operations. I don't tell them what it is, I just remind them that they need to consider that when doing their calculations. So when we plug the numbers in, we end up with 204 centimeters minus 21 centimeters divided by 35 thirds equals x. This also brings up the question of fractions and multiplying and dividing by fractions. So when you divide by a fraction, you actually multiply by the inverse of that fraction or by the reciprocal. So we have 204 centimeters minus 21 centimeters all together in parentheses, times 3 35ths equals x. So we distribute the 3 through and end up with 612 centimeters minus 63 
centimeters divided by 35. Please make sure your students remind them to add that equals x after each step. This will make your math teachers very happy. So we end up with 549 centimeters divided by 35 equals x, which gives us 15.68. I do not teach significant figures. I think it is in um, the eighth grade curriculum at some point. Uh, however, it's not in our course of study and it hurts my brain and it hurts my students' brains. So I choose to spend a little extra time on some other things to prepare them for their high school career and I do not go into significant figures. So I always teach my students to round to the nearest hundredth place unless I tell them otherwise. So we have 15.68 is the number of rubber bands they should use for Barbie to fall 204 centimeters and her to have the most exciting exquisite ride in the world without cracking her head on the floor. This does bring in a problem because you cannot have 0.68 rubber bands. Now, some of my students in the past have tried to cut rubber bands. Um, they have tried to tie them off, put extra knots in them to limit their stretchiness um, to get to that exact point. Uh, but what I tell my students is now as a group, you have to make a decision. You want to play it safe and go with 14 rubber bands. Do you want to just round down and go with 15 rubber bands or do you want to take a chance and round up to 16 rubber bands? So that gives them time to have discussion about these numbers, what they mean, and what are some of the other variables within the rubber bands, such as how tightly they tie the knots. If the rubber bands have been used before, they're already a little stretchy, so you might want to be a little more conservative. Those types of conversations go on, which again are excellent science conversations to have. I hope you find as much joy and excitement in Barbie Bungie as I do. It is a very comprehensive lab that brings in conversations about potential and kinetic energy, types of potential energies, that energy transfer, it, gravity, as well as graphing skills and the math component.